Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. And just like that, we're live. Holy moly, this is a good one. This is, man, this is where I get to geek out on conversational marketing. I've been stoked to have this conversation. My guest today, so excited to introduce you to him. He's a leader in the sales and marketing space, in the tech space. He's a serial entrepreneur, 22 years plus in the business, former SVP GM at Salesforce, co-founder Get Feedback, which is dot, 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 my favorite survey app. Uh, and now, co-founder at Qualified, Sean Wiley. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you doing, Casey? Man, I almost got lost in your introduction. There's just so many things to talk about. <laughs> so thanks for coming on here. Um, here's the theme. We're going to talk conversational marketing. We're going to talk all about, and you know, Qualified is my favorite tool for that. I'm just stoked to have you on here. We're just going to talk all about conversations and bots and forms and marketing and so i want to pass you this it's heavy but uh, i think you you can handle it i think you work out this is thor's hammer so go ahead and take that and uh smash for me some kind of myth or bogus strategy something that's driving you crazy some misconception that you just need to set the record straight once and for all well this hammer is heavy so i'm only going to use it once okay um, the thing uh, that you sort of is top of mind these days is sort of how marketing is changing. Uh, marketing is going through kind of a renaissance. And I always go back to um, when I got into SaaS marketing um, in 2007, uh, when Teen Zoo was talking about this new world of marketing. And mm. uh, it was about the kind of when field marketing was changing to kind of a two tiered model where you, know, you did things digitally that were trackable for the first time. And then you hired inside salespeople to kind of do a lot of the qualification and follow up to make sure that they, the, the, the prospects that were coming in were actually a good fit or showing the right interest in, in their business. And I think we're going, and you saw the emergence of all of these marketing automation companies like Pardot, yeah. of course, and you know, all the others, I won't mention them on your show because I know you're a Pardot guy. Yeah, Pardot. What up, Pardot? <laughs> yeah. But um, we think that marketing is going to go through a, a pretty big transformation. And as a result, um, there's a lot of different new technologies emerging as part of the stack. And the thing I, the thing I can't get away from is how AI-powered bots are going to drive pipeline for your marketing organization. And they're also going to replace SDRs. And this is kind of some of the messaging that's out there right now. And, and that's the myth? Is that that's the case? And, and this in my opinion, will not happen. It definitely is not happening now, and it's definitely not going to happen anytime soon. Mm. Um, so the fact that you can throw um, something completely automated on your website to have nuanced conversations about buying your products and services, and that's going to be your only avenue, um, is, is something I, I absolutely do not believe. Why do we? Why do people think that? What? Who? What are we smoking here? What's going on? I mean, automation is great. Um, the beautiful thing about automation is um, it replaces people, and people are expensive. Uh, right. You pay their W two, and you yeah. pay for their real estate, and you health pay insurance, their, yeah, health insurance. But people are also your most valuable commodity. Um, so I think the it's not a it's not it's not whether or not humans will be replaced by robots. It's just people's jobs are going to change um, and people are still going to be as valuable as they are today. They're just going to be focused on other things. And what we believe at Qualified is that if you can figure out how to match people with uh, people showing propensity to buy, people showing buying signals, people that fit your ideal customer profile, that that's a really good use of their time. Uh, but there's a lot of other things, especially today in an age where there's research-based buys, where there's so much information, there's much content. Uh, not everyone wants to buy a product or service, especially in B2B. So maybe it's not the right time to talk to them, right? So it's finding that mix of automation. Automation could be bots. It can be forms. It could be other versions of automation. Um, but also making sure that if somebody is on your site or on your landing pages or on you know, some one of your web properties and they're actually 
expressing interest in your product or service and they want to talk to you, if they're a good fit, you have to talk to them now because if you don't get them now, they're going to go to your competitor site. They're going to go move on to other things in their schedule. Like right now, Casey, you and I are talking. I guarantee at the top of the hour, you're going to move on to another thing and you're not going to think about this thing until it's time to go to post-production. Uh, Actually, you know, we're going to talk for about two or three hours today, and then I'm just going to obsess over this episode until we, we go live. But no, but I know what you're talking about, right? Like, you, you got to stay, stay with what's going on. Yeah, you got to be fast. You got to be relevant. Yeah. Uh, but to do that is really hard, right? And bots do play a part in that because bots are great at asking qualifying questions. They're great at engaging you per perhaps into a different funnel than your information hierarchy on your website provides. Uh, they're really good at booking meetings when you have no capacity or you have no availability. They're good at those things. But really, the thing that drives pipeline, the things that keep CMOs up all night, their big pipeline number, are going to be nuanced conversations between humans where you can do mm. objection handling and talk about pricing packaging and talk about what your product or service provides and the value that it provides. And you can understand the political landscape of an account and who the decision makers are. Bots don't do these things. And you know, today I think that the more realistic goal is that you're going to use bots kind of like forms, mm -hmm. um, but they're a little bit more advanced. Um, they can learn, um, you can actually build more logic into them. Um, I think forms are dying. I think bots are emerging, but I think that bots are, um, kind of a more advanced form of a form. Mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of sense. It, you know, it, it kind of to take a step back, you know, when you created get feedback, I was an instant fan because what I was used to was this old, terrible survey monkey forms, which ironically enough, they're all one company now, but I would like little like HTML boxes and just ugh, how many, how many more pages of this survey do I have? But then get feedback. The, I always tell people the questions fly in from the right and they're like, here's your next question. When you, it's like fun to answer it and you answer it and it flies off and the next one comes in and you don't even mind if you answered a bunch of questions because it's just a new way of doing it. So I, I see where you're going with the idea that like the form, it's kind of like that survey monkey thing. And you know, what's that next form? Maybe it is the bots, but they can't do everything. Yeah. I mean, look, I think for, you know, and, and I'm specifically talking about sales and marketing, you know, I sure. think bots, you know, probably, you know, tremendously valuable to a support organization. Uh, it's a lot of structured conversations, right? And I think, you know, bots are going to be vital uh, to scale a support organization. For sales, I think, you know, they have their place, but right now sure. I think it's still, your best bet is to kind of facilitate human one-to-one -one conversations if you can do it. And you're kind of using bots for the rest um, right. and finding that mix based on your capacity, based on your process. You know, that's the hard part, right? It's kind of figuring out like how this works with your go-to-market. Um, but right. you know, I get, I get feedback, like you said, Casey, um, we wanted to provide a better customer experience. Mm -hmm. And um, when we started get feedback, we were really kind of focused, focused on the mobile problem where at that sure. time, more and more traffic was coming from mobile devices. And we wanted to build a survey application that was born on the mobile web. Mm -hmm. And that kind of led us to, um, you know, an area where we said, what if, what if survey monkey and Pinterest had a baby, what would it look like? <laughs> um, yeah. That's kind of how we came up with get feedback. But then, you know, as time went on, we also realized that it wasn't just about getting engagement from a better user experience. It was also about tying it into your process and kind of where we landed at get feedback was of course, tying it into your customer master. So whenever there was an interaction between um, a prospect or a customer and a company, you could actually always kind of understand how did it go? How can we can improve and make sure that that goes into your customer master, which is the heart of every company. Yeah. hundred percent. Like how we used it is, or use it is if you finish a project with us, you get a net promoter kind of questionnaire at the end. You recommend it. How much do you recommend us? By the way, everyone recommends us. And then uh, the other thing we do is pre-sale. We have this, um, this maturity model for marketing automation between zero and 10. And it kind of, you ask, answer questions and it tells you where you're at. And we use that to walk through that process with people. But the reason we do is because then it saves it in their, their record. We can go back and look and see how they're doing. It's, it's it's important to have that. Yeah, for I mean, for you guys especially, right? It's, this is a this is a really important engagement where you're getting you know into their systems, into their process. There's a lot of different types of interactions, and when you're done, like you know, you you want to know probably more than anyone in the world, like what could you improve? You know, did you did you hit budget? Right. Did you 
timeline. Like how is, you know, that's how you get better. Um, so, um, but you know, that there was a big automation component to get feedback where you, you know, you created a workflow trigger in Salesforce where you could send a survey yeah. at certain points in a process and that's automation and that's great. And more likely than not, that's kind of set it and forget it, right? So when a process gets to this point, a stage changes or some record is updated, you can automatically trigger a survey into someone's inbox. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. That's not the way a sales and marketing process is set up. Right, exactly. exactly. It's not as structured and it's not as simple. Um, so I think that, you know, the hard part about conversational marketing in this world we're in is that, first of all, everything is changing really fast. Sure. Everything is speeding up. Everything is data driven. And it's requiring like some business transformation. And I, I, I draw a lot of parallels between account-based marketing and conversational marketing in that the lines are, are, are blurring more and more between the revenue team and the marketing team. It's not um, something that you'd like to be aligned. It's something where if you're not aligned, it just simply doesn't work. Right. Right. Definitely. They're, they're blurring, and especially with qualified. I mean, we've got it and our sales team is using it. So like marketing set it up, but it's not like our baby. We're going to protect it. We're not going to share it with anyone. No, we need sales to be utilizing it. They're the right person to your point earlier. You said, you know, if they're doing research and they want to talk to someone right now, give them someone right now. And, and that person's usually in sales. And, and so it, there's like massive alignment that has to happen. Otherwise they're getting either noise or the right leads or the wrong leads. And I mean, to your point, that whole transformation, it's kind of under, underneath the surface though. We think, Oh, I'm just getting chat. Right. Or we're just getting bots, but no, no, no. There's this whole process that can change underneath. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty hard to do, you know, and every company is different. Every, system, every company's systems landscape is different. Their process is different. Their capacity is different. Their qualification framework is different. It's really not an easy problem to solve, but, you know, the impact can be material. Um, and when you start quite simply by saying, like, I'm a marketer, where am I spending money? Like, if I'm, if I'm buying LinkedIn's graph yeah. and I'm targeting specific business titles or industries, you know, when they come there – why would I treat them the same as someone who just willy nilly came to my website and wasn't a good fit. Right. And there's a lot of intelligence in your systems. There's lead scores and there's lead mm -hmm. rates, Einstein scoring and intent scores. And there's all this information. There's a lot of stuff in your CRM as well. Like do have I ever had an opportunity with this business? Um, have I ever talked to this contact before? Do I have any information about them? There's all this information that you have, but historically we've never used it in real time when someone's on the site and we're in a world now that you can do that. But to do that, it's really hard. And where it gets more complicated is like how you route, um, you know, is it based on record ownership and part out? Is it based on record ownership and mm -hmm. Salesforce? Like what's a fallback? If they come and they want to talk to you and you've talked to them before, do you hook them up with the same person or do you send them to somebody else? Are they going right. to get mad that, that their lead now is talking to someone else? The business kind of wants you to talk to them as fast as you can. Yeah. But your rules of engagement might say something different. So, you know, you get into that good old world of, of sales and marketing and the processes. And the difference though, is it's, it's on steroids. Everything is fast in real time. And, right. you know, you start to think about um, your processes, you know, in terms of the capabilities that exist today, you know, am I actually set up in a way where I'm taking advantage of all of the things that are there? Um, and I think we are really kind of entering a renaissance for, for demand gen. And I think that there's a lot of new tools. I think marketers are trying to consume all of these tools and what they mean for their strategy. Um, and I think, you know, that when I see companies like really sitting down, that's why I think account-based marketing is a really great exercise for companies because it gets down to sort of the roots of like, who do we want to be talking to? Who's a good fit for us? Let's get aligned as a business and the content that we generate and the programs and the campaigns right. and all of those things we're going to align on it. But for us, we kind of think of conversational marketing. Pardot calls us the last mile problem where mm. you're doing all this stuff. And when they come and they engage with your company, we call it the magic moment. Like they are there. Your product or service is top of mind for some period of time. You have to talk to these people if you're spending money to get them to your site. The reason you're spending money to get them to your site is you think you could drive value into their company or business. You know, you need to talk to these people. You do not want to have these people filling out forms. You do not want to have these people talking to bots. Um, and to do this, you have to be very data driven, right? You have to have you know, really good data, like complete data, healthy data. And you also have to have strong integration infrastructure across your, your systems landscape. And, you know, this is all hard stuff. It's not easy to do. 
Yeah, definitely cutting edge. In, but just the, even the idea, this last mile, it, the idea of you have a decision maker on your site right now. It's, and you know this because of other data. It's no longer siloed. It's there. The system can see it. You want to talk to them. Like don't, you know, so much of marketing, maybe this sort of current phase and sort of leaving it now is the old, you know, fill this out, we'll get back to you. It's like we're in a voicemail pager world where it's like, fill out this form, send in this the self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll get back to you. And they will have a hard time getting back to you, right? Because sales is always trying to connect and they have to make what, like five, 20 calls to contact someone. But if they were right there at the moment, that magic moment, well, that's like a perfect chance. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it, it doesn't always work out like that, you know, and you know, you know, you're the CEO of your business, Casey. And if you guys decided to, to buy some, uh, some transformational software, you know, you're probably going to do a lot of due diligence. You're going to look at a lot of vendors. You're going to sure. read a lot of content. You're going to look at, talk to people who have used these systems, but more often than not, you could have asked someone on your team to, to do an RFP and it might be yeah. them on the site, right? It might yeah. be them on their site. You know, if somebody's coming from G2 crowd, you know that they're looking at other vendors besides you, right? right. So not only is speed important, but it's also getting them connected with the right person in your company who can actually articulate, you know, what that person is looking for. So, right. you know, it, it varies depending on what kind of business you're at, but speed matters. Speed is important. And when we started this company, we went to Salesforce and we talked to uh, a guy named Shahan Prasad and he's actually moved on from Salesforce now, but he's a really, you know, impressive guy. And he ran Salesforce's sales development organization, which is, which is pretty big as you can imagine. Yeah. And he, he put up something on the, we asked him what matters to you. We were just really doing some information. Gathering. That's cool. And he put something up on the, on the board and he, he started drawing it like a formula and he called it his fundamental theorem of SDR speed. And he said, there's three components. He said, there's speed to lead, speed to speed to meeting and speed to cadence. He said, speed, it matters. And he said, you can make a small change in your initial response time, which directly correlates to the amount of pipeline that we're generating. Uh, so wow. he said that the, the number one channels for them were 1-800-NO-SOFTWARE and chat. Those are the absolutely the top two channels for them. And the reason being is those people are showing strong buying signals because they do want to interface with you. And also you're doing it in real time. And he said that those were their top two channels. So, you know, chat is this sort of misnomer that people think it's about having just a, a chat utility on the website. Right. But it's more about being targeted and selective and building an experience uh, that's unique to who somebody is and how they relate to, you know, your business. Right. The unique experience. And you can only go so far. I mean, I think we were saying earlier, like automation isn't bad. You just, there's a time and place for it, but it also can't make, you know, the end degree decisions and customizations and alterations that one SDR salesperson or someone on a chat can, can make in a split, you know, split second to, to customize that journey for that buyer. I mean, that's like, that's the dream is to customize it that well. And, you know, you can only have a couple of personas and a couple of nurture campaigns, but you can have sort of unlimited paths if someone's chatting with someone. So I, yeah. I, I see that. I mean, it goes both ways, right? I mean, you know, raise your hand if you want to talk to a bot. <laughs> right? Like, I, I'd be surprised if anyone's hand in any room is up right now. No yeah, one wants to those on bot. audio, no one's hand went up. <laughs> but, but that being said, you know, um, your resources are finite in your business. Right. And if you want to talk to someone in my company, um, I reserve the right to make sure that you're somebody that it's going to be valuable for both of us. Right. So bots asking a few qualifying questions and then routing them to the appropriate place in your company. Um, that's acceptable. Um, if you do it in the right way, you should never try to mimic a human. Um, there's a lot of different permutations of this you see, but at the end of the day, the way that we see this is if you want to connect with someone in our business, um, we reserve the right to ask you a few questions to a, make sure that we're a good fit for one another, but B to get you to the right resource that can resolve your issue quickly or answer your question, you know, um, promptly. I mean, that's, that's, so it's, it's humans and bots working together, right? But right. Do I believe like, you know, getting back to my, my Thor hammer, yeah. do I believe that putting bots on your website are going to drive pipeline and help your CMO get more sleep? No, I don't. But do I think it can help your, uh, your SDRs, your BDRs be more efficient with their time? Yeah, I do. 
Yeah, it's the intersection, right? I mean, you, you can't have a million human hours. You can with bots, but no one wants to buy from one. So it's sort of like, where's that magic mathematical intersection of those two where you're most of you, you know, you're only talking to a bot as long as you need to. And then as soon as we know that you are someone that we want to talk to right now, it's like, here's Casey, here's Sean, you know, no delay. Yeah. And it's fine. You know, every, and that's different for everybody, right? Based on right. their capacity, based on their process, based on their volume, it's different for everyone. But you know, there's, if there's one thing that I do know on most of my customer calls is that my customer knows their business a hell of a lot better than I do. And yeah, for sure. it's more, it's more a fact, it's more sort of a factor of us explaining like, these are some capabilities that we have. How does this fit into your process? And now we're actually having some even more transformational conversations about people saying, I think I need to make some changes to accommodate this because it's really, really? powerful, right? Okay. Um, so again, like this goes back to when we started this company, we, we made a bet that the way that people go to market right now in terms of their sales and marketing is going to go through a renaissance. Right. Um, we think that that's going to happen across a lot of different places. But, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we always draw a parallel to the, to the B2C world, right? The B2C world is always out ahead of B2B a bit. They have more feedback cycles. They have more traffic, more volume. Right. You know, they're way out ahead, right? Right, yeah. And when you look at the bar that the B2C world has set now, it's amazing, right? I mean, you go to Amazon and it shows, you know, Casey bought this. Or yeah. if you're like me, you know, my, my wife and I share an account. So my wife, so sometimes I get some strange targeting from Amazon. But it's really, <laughs> I bet. It's not a static site. It's based sure. on historical interactions. It's very customized and personalized to me. And if I want to go watch a movie, I watch it now. If I want to go listen to a song, I listen to it immediately. If I want to order groceries, I get them within 45 minutes here in the Bay Area. Wow. So, I mean, it's a different bar. And B2B companies can no longer operate the way that they have. They can no longer send targeted traffic to a website, have them fill out a form, and then engage in a game of asynchronous calendar synchronization. I mean, every sales leader in the world has had this experience where they see their sales team disappear into a conference room and walk out five minutes later for a meeting that was scheduled for an hour because it wasn't qualified. That's a big problem. Right. That's a giant time sucking noise and right. money sucking sound in your company. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's all about, there's a lot of data out there and there's a lot of utilities out there to make sure that your people our maximum are hitting their maximum stride at work in terms of all their engagements and interactions are very qualified. It's not right. to say you're going to win everything, but as a marketer, your number one job is to drive pipeline for the sales organization. That's why you're there. Right. Um, and you know, you, you work so hard on the content and the campaigns. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's an amazing feeling when you do get those targeted people to your site having them fill out a form and leave doesn't meet the bar anymore. And that's no. going away. No, it doesn't. Like we've been trained, you know, we buy differently to point B to C has been in, in ahead, but it also, it, 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 your point sets the bar or it gets us all, our expectations are a lot higher. They're different. I mean, you can yeah. call Zappos and order a pizza, right? <laughs> so like it, it's not even the same world anymore. And then you have this sort of static form sitting there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, chat is sexy, but it, I also like that the topic of qualification. I mean, qualify. I love it's the name because it's like, this is the game. This is what we're talking about because I know that when you first turn on any chat and you just sort of open the, the door, it's cool. It's cute. It's fun. All of a sudden you start seeing all these web visitors, but you don't actually want to talk to everyone. And, you know, I, I did this myself at the very beginning. I'm like, ooh, let me, let me talk to everyone. Let me just harass people on my website. I'm wasting my time, right? Like, we need to still have that intersection of, of the right person at the right place at the right time. And especially when we talk about this transformation where sales is manning the, the phone here, they're manning the chat. If we send them noise in the marketing world, then it's the same problem we've had historically where we send them too many poor quality MQLs and they're like, your leads suck. If we send them too many sucky chats, they're not going to pay attention to that either. So it's like, it's really important that we qualify. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons we chose the, the, the brand qualified is that, you know, you walk into any pipeline council meeting, any marketing meeting, like qualified is a term that's thrown around an awful lot. I mean, yeah, MQLs and SQLs and it's all about like, 
being qualified and it works both ways. You know, I mean, I gave you that example of the, the sales rep walking into a conference room and walking out because it was not a qualified yeah. uh, interaction. Um, it works the same way we're de disqualifying, right? So sometimes yeah. you can have a quick conversation and just very quickly come to the realization that we're not a good match for one another for, for a variety of reasons. Let's, right. let's, let's get some time back and let's, you, you go search for another solution. I'm going to focus on someone else. Um, so it's not just about sort of more pipeline, but it's about a better pipeline, right? Yeah, because yeah. that first meeting that often takes three weeks is happening in real time on your website. Right. Um, if you can scale that um, across your process, um, the bottom of the funnel starts looking a lot better. Right. And now more chats, better chats. Better you know, chats. You don't, you don't want a thousand, you're not doing customer service for a B2C brand. You want better chats. I'll take three, they're going to end up in SOWs over, you know, 80. <laughs> None of them are, are qualified. That's right. That's right. And and we also think that chat, you know, is, is kind of one component. You know, we have... We've got a built-in telephony into our messenger um, because we think that um, a lot of interactions start with a chat. It's pretty easy, but then if it if it evolves, um, you can move it to a telephone conversation and then move to shared context like we have right now, where we're right. both looking at the same thing. We right. have shared context. We can have a phone conversation. And like really, you know, when we started the company, we said, what if your website was a Zoom already? Yeah. Like, why is it your website just going to tell you hey, there's a qualified visitor on here based on a campaign ID or based on a referral URL or based on a golden page or based on a form that they filled out previously or based on a lead score. Like, why wouldn't we just turn your website into a Zoom meeting right then and there? Right. Um, you know, that's, you know, we think that- It's true, right? You, you start, you dip your toe in the water with a little little chat. You're like, oh, this is cool. I'm talking to a human. But it's like, okay, I real, I'm not a, I'm not 17 anymore. I, can we have a real conversation here? It's like, yeah, hit a button, phone call, maybe a little screen share, get right on the, you know, get on the, the actual connection then after that. But yeah, to your my, point, my it's, it's a, has a My dad has a golden rule uh, about, about, about texting. And he says, yeah. there's a text conversation that's more than five. We have to phone, we have to jump on a phone call. And I've always, I found it's pretty interesting because texting is really easy. And it's interesting. There's a different dynamic when you're chatting with someone versus when you're talking to them on the phone. Yeah. But you know, sometimes when you're chatting with someone, it becomes evident like, Hey, let's just top of the call. Um, yeah. let's, let's share screens. Let's, um, let's take this to the next, let's go on a, on the next level of our date. Um, yeah, but you know, it right. doesn't, doesn't always, it doesn't always work out like that, you know, but, um, it's, it sure is a good, simple starting point, but you know, from our, again, from our perspective, not everyone should have access to chat. The right. people that should have access to chat are people who are showing some kind of a buying signal or some kind of a fit. Right. Um, because a lot of our customers, you know, the SDRs or BDRs are kind of like, whoa, 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 website chat, whoa, whoa, whoa. When we explain the concept around like, no, 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 no. When you're chatting with someone, we've done some qualification for you. Right. Uh, based on what the marketing team has done or based on some questions that have happened, been answered, like we, we've done some qual for you. You know, this is a person that you should talk to. Um, and that's kind of the that's kind of the dynamic. And again, that's kind of another, another myth is that, you know, chat bots are going to drive pipe. It's not chat bots, but it's what happens underneath the chat and behind the chat and the data right. behind it. That's the, that's the harder part. The chat is just the tip of the iceberg. Right. Right. Yeah. It, the, it's like kind of the same thing that I was always my big thing with like inbound. You don't, you don't just magically do inbound and then your sales grow. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's more to it. Same thing with chat. You don't just magically put a, a, a chat bot with antenna on your site and then you, then your leads will just flow in like candy, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember the first time I tried to get a hold of you, Casey, I had heard through the grapevine that, you know, there was a guy named Casey Cheshire that had like the, there was the world's foremost expert on Pardot. And I was new to Pardot at that time. And I had some Pardot questions and actually a Salesforce person sent me to you. And I sent you three or four emails before you got back to me. And what was funny is really Did I just not respond to you it just ghosted me, <laughs> Oh and, God! <laughs> but then, but then actually I sent you my LinkedIn profile and it was funny because you sent me a note back and said, Oh my God, I just, I just bought qualified. I just bought it. Um, and it, but it was funny because I was just sending you these kind of blanket emails, not qualified in any way, wasn't relevant to addresses from you. And I was right. in the back of the queue. But as soon as we figured out we had some alignment on something, you no, know, we jumped onto a call and jumped onto a Zoom. And uh, we've you know, kind of known each other ever since. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I, I mean, I, I've been a big fan ever since, I mean, 
back in the day with, with qualified and you know i remember you know you just kind of start up mode back then doing that and just be like hey you know let's help people out we think once we figured out to get feedback um part out mail merge it was just like oh we're, we're going to town on this one and there's this little tiny thing you could drop in there and so people would click a link and the survey would automatically attach their salesforce record never had to ask their name their email anything it was, it was like magic and it was it was great it was sold <laughs> well, that's why that's why when you're building it's always um we always feel so lucky to have you know some of the some you know pros like yourselves to use our software because we're right now we're building software to help you build pipeline yeah. like that's the goal of this product qualified is to help you build pipeline and you know who better to use it than companies like yours and people right. um, probably will have 10 ideas for every one we have about like how this can actually drive pipeline because you work across the entire the entire process um so we, yeah. we love we love it when folks like yourselves get our product uh, in your hands and you guys help us drive a really great roadmap. Yeah, and I love it. And so the, the hard part is keeping my hand on the cookie jar because our sales team is actively engaged based on routing and magic moments and all this. And it's like, I love to just interject myself and have a chat, but it's like, I'm not in the process. So um, maybe I'll throw myself on the, the podcast chat. Ah, there, that's my territory. <laughs> if, you, if you go to hardcoremarketing.com, those of you listening, we have chat on there too. So maybe, maybe I'll go man that one and we'll keep, we'll keep sales and Cheshire impact or whatnot. Absolutely. But this is fantastic, man. Who are you? Where did you come from? Serial entrepreneur, founder, 22 years in the biz. Did you always know you're going to build things and all that? Take us back. Take us nah, back. Like nah. uh, little Sean days. You know, I didn't, you know, I, I grew up, um, I grew my, a lot of my family was in uh, there. You're either an architect or you were uh, a programmer. Uh, in <laughs> fact, a lot of my family came from Unisys. So I grew up wow. with like, you know, I never got a real computer. Um, I had like sort of, it looked like a, you know, a keyboard and a motherboard stitched together with like a soldering iron. And wow. you know, I, usually, I, I didn't really know, you know, a lot about it. I started out uh, trying to be a programmer. It turned out I was a terrible programmer. Um, it be like didn't... next door neighbors with Wozniak or something. And no, no, no. I grew up. I grew up in Virginia. Um, oh, Virginia? No kidding. Yeah. What part? Uh, Reston, Reston, Virginia. Okay, cool. I was born in uh, the Norfolk area. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So I, I vacationed in the Outer Banks. Still do. In fact, I, I drag my nice. kids back from California to to the Outer Banks. Still think it's the best beaches in the world. Um, but yeah, one of my first jobs, uh, corporate jobs, um, was actually uh, when I was in grad school, I got a job as an intern at America Online. I was employee 95. In uh, Reston, Virginia. Yeah, yeah. Virginia. AOL. It was actually at Tyson's Corner when I was there. Okay. Uh, I had Sean at AOL as an intern. Uh, Whoa. And that was kind of, they were, you know, the de facto ISP. And I sort of watched that company grow. I worked there for um, a couple different years, a couple couple years. Um, I actually started helping the um, one of the teams implement SAP and PeopleSoft. So okay. I was using access databases to clean up data before it got uploaded into those big ERP systems. Wow! Um, and then you know from there, um, the ERP systems got really hot. I got tired of living in my parents' basement, and uh, I took a job consulting with PwC and spent a whole bunch of time in the enterprise. What a difference, though, huh? Like, you're living with the rents, working for AOL. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was also that that was just such a different world. I think about how hard it was. Like, I, I implemented accounts payable, general ledger, and procurement. Um, for That's actually how I met my business partner, Craig, is we were implementing that for Sony Pictures, and I met him on a POC there. Um, but you know, that world of on-premise proprietary software, that was a rough world. Um, yeah, I think that. now, um, back then, I remember seasoned guys talking about, you know, using mainframes and so forth and kicks and IMS. And, and then I got into, you know, SAP and PeopleSoft and Oracle and JD Edwards at Bond and Siebel. And we did that stuff. And then when Salesforce came out, you know, it was just like a bright and shiny new thing where there was right. APIs and everything was delivered over the web. You didn't have to install software and buy, you know, servers. And I mean, you know, how fast things have moved over time. I think about how lucky we are now when I go to build an integration now, which is, you know, that's kind of 
a big part of usually the things we do is integrating really tightly into the customer master, into the MA system. But it's just, when I think about how hard it used to be, installing adapters and, you know, having proprietary data formats, Jeez. like now it's just everything has an API and there's web services and it's just, everything is just glorious now. It's, a, it's so much easier. It's amazing though, but like all these different apps you're throwing out there, you definitely sound like, like your family, like a programmer, like a, like a super nerd. Did, were you in, were you like a tech nerd for AOL and all those companies or program no. manager? Or what did you do there? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I taught myself access. It was the first relational database I yeah. ever used. And effectively they just give me, they just, I was a grunt in the corner and they just threw massive, massive files at me. I moved it to Excel, imported it into access and cleaned it up. And then I, imported it into either SAP or PeopleSoft. And that was kind of what okay. I did all day. And then got into some other things. But I, I did try, I did try for about two years um, as a developer. Not a not a real developer, not like a full stack engineer like we yeah. have here, but um, using the tools that mm -hmm. uh, SAP and PeopleSoft had to actually like write some code. I knew it wasn't my my calling. I didn't have a computer science background. Um, but I learned enough about it to understand how sure. the systems work. Um, and then I, I actually moved over to be a sales engineer. Um, that was my, my first job was uh, with a company called Web Methods, which okay. was an integration infrastructure um, between all these kind of proprietary systems. And it's kind of the mule soft of their day. Yeah, sure. Um, but um, that's actually where I met my business partner. We've been working together now for 22 years, three companies of our own and six companies overall. So we've been working together ever since. Yeah, like it's a great, it's a great dynamic duo you started to get into the story like you guys met you were both on site somewhere at a customer site what was the what was the deal yeah so um one of my first uh, all-nighters uh as a consultant <laughs> was at a company uh, was at a company called sony pictures entertainment and we were implementing um you know a whole bunch of software and we were at the the, the team was there uh, up all night working on a project wow. and in the middle of the night some woman comes in and she's carrying a plate of cookies and some burritos. And then she lit and she left. And I was pretty tired. I thought maybe I didn't actually see this woman, but <laughs> she's a ghost. Uh, but then uh, my business partner, Craig, came in and I said, You know, I think some woman just came in and dropped off a whole plate of delicious cookies and some burritos. And he goes, Oh, yeah, that's my mom. <laughs> uh, so Mama Swindrew came in and dropped off some food. And we, we happened to be working down in the San Diego area because uh, so got it. LA um, and that's actually where where we met and we we um, shortly founded our own company after web methods um, and we've uh, and that was acquired by Salesforce we worked there for several years my business partner Craig was actually the CMO of Salesforce he worked for for Mark for a while and right Mark uh, Mark gave him a lot of pretty amazing lessons in terms of yeah I'll say yeah. Big budgets too, man. Yeah. What, a, what, a, what a job. But how does, it, how does that go from you meet somebody, you share some burritos and cookies to eventually being like, you know, I think we could start something here. Like how, how does that happen? Yeah. Um, it, it, so the way that this happened is that Craig, uh, Craig and I were working at this company, Web Methods. And what we yeah. started to see effectively was the cloud. Uh, back there, it was called On Demand. And right. we saw this kind of software delivery model happening. And he actually took a job at a company called Grand Central Communications, which was effectively kind of the, it was at the time, basically a, 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 a registry of web services that would help you connect various cloud companies. And we saw all of these sort of web services emerging, which is, you know, effectively this company did integration in the cloud. Yeah. Um, but the thing was, there wasn't much cloud. Um, but what <laughs> we did notice is there was one node that was always there that was called Salesforce. And so we looked at this, uh, Craig said, you got to take a look at this. So I go and before I figured out like, wow, I don't need to install anything. I don't need to update any drivers. I just need to go to a browser. First of all, I was infatuated from that perspective. Yeah. But then I went in and I was used to Siebel, which I'll just be honest. I was not a fan. <laughs> we used to right. work with all, all these, these pretty hard to use systems, SAP, PeopleSoft, um, JD Edwards, uh, Oracle, Siebel was the one I disliked the most. And so I went into uh, Salesforce, I built a workflow, I created a custom field, I did a couple of things, I sent something to see it. And this is reading nothing, just jumping into the app, going into the tools. 
And uh, I was sold. And we said, yeah. we got to find out what the Salesforce thing is about. And then we found out they were building a platform and we've been building on that platform ever since. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You, I mean, you, and you were in the thick of the on-prem. So you're like, okay, this really sucks. Like, and then, so when the, uh, the cloud world started servicing, it wasn't just marketing. It's like so much more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we also just saw that they were, you know, when you see someone building a platform, right. And you start to see what you can do on that platform at a certain point in time, you could just tell that Salesforce was a company that got it. Yeah. Um, they started that platform pretty early. Um, you know, they were still building obviously their, their apps, you know, back then it was called SFA Salesforce automation. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you could tell that there was, when they started building this platform, you could tell that Mark had a huge vision for this thing. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we were one of the first companies to build on the platform. We built a, an integration between Google AdWords and Salesforce and, you know, effectively telling you what keywords were driving, you know, pipeline and revenue, which is what B2B marketers think about. Wow. Yeah. Depending that are driving tire kickers. Right. So even then it was kind of a variation of who's, which keywords were qualified and which ones were not. Right. Um, so it was kind of a, you know, not dissimilar to what we're doing now. Right. It was, a, it was about, you know, which clicks and creatives were actually driving leads uh, into your CRM system. Um, and, you know, it's funny, we, we, we presented at Google um, after we were acquired and we presented at Google's TGIF, which is their all hands or everyone's there. And Sergey Bren was there and mm. he was on stage with us. And we said, they said, you have six minutes. And we said, okay. So we got into this demo where we, 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 we bought some keywords, we wrote a creative, we published it to the web, we clicked on the, um, on the ad, went to a lead form, filled out the lead form, it went in as a lead, and then we converted it to an opportunity, and then to close revenue, and then we showed you, hey, for this $55 keyword, it drove this much in pipeline and revenue, and then we sort of said, ta-da, and we looked out, and the audience was sitting there scratching their heads, and we were sort really? of like, oh man, did we bomb? And um, the, the guy raised his hand, and he said, I don't get it. He goes, you just spent $55 on a keyword. They went to your site. Why did they just check out? You sent them away. And we were like, no, this is B2B. Like, you know, that's our sales process. We, we, yeah. we have you fill out a form and leave. And they were going, seems stupid. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, that's where we actually learned about the magic moment. Because Google said the magic moment someone's looking for your product and service is after they clicked on an ad because they just searched for it. And now they're on your site. But in the B2C world, you check out. In the B2B world, historically, you filled out a form. We think right. that those days are going away where yeah. when, you've, when you've managed to get them to your site and interested and they're a good fit, you should try to have a conversation if at all possible instead of having them fill out a form and leave them away and hope to God you can get them back. Right, right. And harass them on the phone and email till kingdom come. That, that's crazy. Then you're in front of everyone and the powers that be at Google and wow. Yeah, it was, wow. it was just a different world, you know. They were they they were very B two C, and we were B two B, and it was it was you know you saw, you know, very quickly. And this is before you know Google like grew their their enterprise business to, to yeah. what it is today, which is you know, I'm guessing it's probably north of four billion dollars. I mean, it's massive. Can't imagine. Yeah, totally. Hey, I'm curious though. Tell me the soccer. What's the deal? You were a pro soccer player. I played soccer for quite a while. Yeah. Um, I Since when? Like how, how old were you when you started? Like little kid old kind of thing? I mean, I played kid. soccer too. I grew up in a neighborhood where there was nothing else to do. And you went out and you played soccer. And, um, you know, I, I fell in love with it. It was great. Yeah. I've got a trouble. Um, I've always loved it. My daughters play now. I get excited for their games. Yeah. Um, so I played till I was about 25. Uh, and it provided a lot of, you know, great moments for me. Um, I got a scholarship to go to school and after um, I finished uh, college, I was lucky enough to play for a couple more years. And then uh, what, what kind of league was MLS even around back then or played in the first year of the MLS. No uh, kidding. In the first year of the MLS, uh, they actually didn't have any internationals. Uh, and as soon as the internationals started coming over, that's when I was kind of like, all right, <laughs> time to, uh, it's time to find something else. And, uh, after that, I actually went back to grad school and that's when I actually got my internship at America online. Wow. Right. Right. So like Pele comes over and you're like, okay, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was also just time, you know, it was, uh, yeah. there was not, um, maybe the, the career path that you could have. And sure. I mean, we wouldn't have all these amazing products anyway, so it all worked out. We talked about this earlier. Um, 
I've been really lucky to have worked with some amazing people at some amazing companies and I'm, I've, I've built an amazing network and, uh, you know, at Salesforce specifically, um, right. even the company before that web methods, I still keep in touch with a lot of them and the people I've been working with, the people I work with at Qualify, we've been working together for a really long time. We've got a really good dynamic. Everyone knows everyone really well. Yeah. Everyone counterbalances one another really well. So we have a really good core and I'm happy to come to work every day, even though we're, you know, we're a little tired and you know, we're, we're, we're stretched pretty thin. Um, but you get to go home. <laughs> You know, I get to go home uh, at night, but when I come into the office every day, I, I don't get the Mondays. I don't, uh, yeah. I, I, I look forward to seeing the people in, in our building and working with them every day. It's solving hard problems with them has been yeah. great. We, we, we really enjoy it. That's why we've been, we keep doing it, you know, together. I mean, we've been together, everyone on our team has been together for a decade, at least, and Craig and I have been together for 22 years. So you know, it works pretty well in terms of, you know, just being happy with what you're doing. Yeah, right. I feel like I've been playing hooky for a while. Like someone's going to come and tell me I need to go to school now or something, you know, <laughs> like I've been playing for years. It's crazy. Yeah. So if you could go back in a time machine to back in the day, let's say you just got out of school um, or maybe you're just getting into the workforce after soccer, either way, you go back in time, what would you advise yourself? like in terms of your career, what you've experienced in life, would there be anything you would tell yourself to either do differently or to, to like, to look for? So this is like a back to the future question. Yeah. So, yeah. Am I allowed to play this, the stock market in this scenario or? Yeah. Well, you know what, if you, if you send the almanac back, you know what happens, you know, <laughs> Biff just takes over the world. So. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, it took me a long time to learn that I really loved growth stage. Um, I really do love it. I love team building. I love starting from scratch and building something from nothing. Yeah. Um, I love that. And that's what growth stage is all about is like, you know, starting getting, getting a business off the ground, like picking a problem that you think needs to be solved. You think there's a TAM, um, you think that you have the kind of functional and technical expertise to go out and attack a problem effectively. Yeah. Like I love that, but it took me a long time to get there. And, you know, honestly, like I, I didn't know enough to do something like that. Like when I started, I went to a big company, you know, nothing against big companies, but at big companies, they have roles where they're entry level. Yeah, um, sure. And, um, so I was entry level at a lot of these big companies I worked at. Um, so I didn't really get exposed to um, a lot of areas of a business. You know, when you work at a, you know, you've started your own company that's bigger now, but when you started, I guarantee you did a lot of jobs in that company. Yeah, I did everything. Did everything, right? Still up telling the sales guys, hey, I, I sold it all at the beginning. It was all me. Like, you could do this. Line, and I closed the deals. And, and I, I closed it and did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, get, you just get a, a, a really great appreciation for how hard these jobs are and yeah. what's involved. Yeah. And it, it allows you to be very empathetic um, across kind of every role in a business. You really sort of understand, like, every role is really important. Um, and, it, and when you've done it, you have just a different appreciation of it. Um, right. So I think that that's helped me in my career that I've actually pivoted across a lot of different roles. And I think if I had stayed at a big company, I may be really, really good at one thing, but I wouldn't have gotten exposed to a lot of the other things uh, across a business. So um, I think like if I could have given myself advice, um, I may have gone to small companies earlier and mm. not gone to big companies. Um, because in a small company, you just get exposed to everything. You know, yeah. there's no, you're not, you're not just a cog in the machine. Um, you're a body. And if you're there and able, you're going to get thrown at a lot of different things. And yeah. um, I, I've come to realize I, I kind of enjoy that. So I probably would have moved out of the enterprise and into a smaller business earlier. Um, but again, you know, easier said than done. Sure, sure. And all these experiences, you know, gave you the ability to understand and be able to talk to an enterprise. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, they're very different animals. And um, one of my favorite parts about, you know, being an entrepreneur is that, you know, every day I get to, I get to ask people about their business, you know, and, you know, being an entrepreneur, you know, and the, it's really hard to make more money than you spent, you know, when it comes down, to, <laughs> right, that's kind of what business is. It's like, you know, buy shit, sell it for more, or right. whatever, however you want to put it. It's buy, like, build something really hard, yeah. right? Um, especially when you live in the Silicon Valley and everything is kind of about growth. Um, but you know, if it dies a real thing and 
when you run a business, um, one of the things that I love to do is I like to ask people like, tell me about your business. Like, what's yeah. your business? Like, you guys are buying my software right now. So you guys must have growth goals. You have people, you have, you know, you have a business. So how'd you get there? Tell me about it. And I love to understand like, what was the thing and what mm -hmm. was the thing that enabled us to kind of get this business off the ground and what are our values and what is our process? And I love to, I, it's very interesting to me because I've, I've done it a few times I've, I've, and I've been trying to do it forever. Yeah. So it's really interesting. So every one of my sales conversations that I have with, with, with prospects, I'm very interested in what they have to say. Um, so that just makes my day better because yeah. like most of my meetings are not, are not boring. They're, they're interesting because I'm talking to someone who has a business and they're trying to grow their business. And I want to know what they're thinking about. And, um, you know, it's really cool to have something new, um, that perhaps enables them to do things that they couldn't before. Right. I mean, you're, it sounds like you're, you're a fan and a student of just that value creation. And if you really think about it, like I was doing, as you were describing it, it's like a magical thing, you know? So what, so finding out from people, what is your business? What is it that you do that, you know, you create more value than actually costs to do it? Yep. And it's like, they're all, every time you see it, it's either mystery or it's like magic, you know, yeah. from a Walmart to a small company that pays for the lights to stay on and their employees. And, you know, it's, it's magical how you can stay in business. Yeah. And, and, and we we're, we're squarely focused on obviously the go-to-market process right now and sales yeah. and marketing. And what's really interesting is, you know, one, one hour I'll talk to a company that says I have so much inbound. I don't know how to deal with it. Wow. Great problem to have. Yeah. Um, but still to them, it's a problem, right? Because you have all these people you don't know who to talk to. Yeah. And then there's other people who don't have an inbound problem, but they're spending a lot on outbound. And, you know, that's another, th that's another way to attack a problem because, you know, you, you might not get the volume, but when someone's there, you want to talk to them. Right? right. And then there's people now we're seeing in this new world and, you know, I'm sure you're seeing this as well in your business. People are starting to do more inbound plus outbound plus maybe even some light ABM. When I say light ABM, I just mean, you know, I think that uh, John Miller said this, uh, the CEO of Engageo, he said, he, he talks about ABM as fishing with a spear instead of a net, <laughs> um, which I kind of like the analogy, but it's, um, I think so even smaller companies, like when I grew up, if you had field marketing, um, you were big and you were going after Walmart and you were yeah. going after Target and you're going after the biggest companies in the world. You're going after Apple and IBM. But now companies are, you know, there's enough data out there to be pretty targeted about like sitting down, figuring out like who's good, who's a good fit for what you're trying to do, who's, who looks like some of your really strong customers and how do we go, up, go about it? You know, we have, you know, we have LinkedIn and we have Instagram and we have uh, AdWords and we have a lot of tools that you didn't have before mm -hmm. and you can be more targeted uh, around it. So I think companies are kind of in a lot of ways doing kind of account-based marketing where they, it might not be fully baked. It might not be right. to the degree that you would imagine someone would do, but they're going through some of the motions. And I think it's actually a really healthy exercise because, you know, sometimes you get caught up in all of the day-to-day -day and all the activities and you don't sit down and say, who are we selling to? Who, like, who, who wants this product or service? You know, so just, just yeah. kind of sitting down and resetting and doing, you know, effectively a positioning statement internally across your team and saying like, who are we really building for? And what's the main problem? And, you know, right. so just kind of getting back to basics. Sometimes I think like when you were running really hard with a company, sometimes there's a forcing function to sit you down and make you evaluate kind of what you're doing. Um, right. Sometimes it can help to clarify some things. You know, the parallels are amazing. I know we spoke on it earlier and just now with ABM, but, you know, going through the motions and we were doing that ourselves here to go through the process of ABM and, it's so healthy to just prioritize your customer base. Like, no, you can't, you can't sell everyone, you know, weird, aggressive sales guy. Okay. Pick your battles. Who, who, if you could only have 10 of that list of a hundred, who would they be and why? And is there any method to your madness that maybe you could sort of build into a process? And that same kind of thing happened when I was chatting with Craig and, and he was helping us implement and learn about qualified. It's like, who do you want to talk to? 
and or or where where do your what are your best programs? You know, where are your best leads coming from? And some of these questions you don't necessarily know right off the bat, and it makes you think. And but to your point, you go you go through that exercise and you go research and learn and and learn more about your customer base and your ideal customer that you really want to get to. If you can only talk to a few of them, who would you want to talk? Who's worth your time? Yeah, and it, and it works at all stages of a company. I mean, yeah. You're selling into your your ideal customer profile, right? They shorter sales cycles, higher deal sizes, uh, better retention. I mean, it's yeah. it's glorious when you find someone who's a really good fit. Um, but when you're, you know, for us, um, we've been really um, one of the things that we've learned after every one of our companies was a retrospective when we talk about what we did well and what we could have done better. Nice. Usually, what we could have done better is a much longer list and. We, um, you know, you get so caught up in growth and, um, you know, ARR and, and scaling the business and all of the things you need to do when you grow a business. But we've, we've really tried to put an emphasis on finding some sophisticated customers that, we, that because, you know, if you do it right, you should learn a lot more from your customers than they learn from you. Right. And, you know, that's why we like companies like you guys using our product, because we know that people like Jennifer are going to tell us like, hey, this needs to work like this. It's going to be yeah. better for the customer. And that's for us. We've, we've been um, we've sacrificed some growth early to pick the right people to use our product. And we've tried to spend more time with them yeah. uh, as opposed to kind of scaling this sales army and and kind of getting into like, a you know, hey, you didn't buy this customer success package, so we're not going to actually talk to you. Like we <laughs> consciously avoided that. Yeah, and we probably sacrificed a little bit of growth early, but we feel like we've got some really good customers right now yeah. that represent, you know, currently what our ICP is, who are giving us tons of amazing feedback about sort of what they like, what they don't like, what they want more of, and um, we think that that's the way you get to um, the number one product in a market. Um, and when you have the number one product in a market, there's a lot of wind at your back. So you know, that's kind of where we're starting. Yeah. No, I love that. And it's funny that you were asking other people about their businesses when you're the serial entrepreneur, you know, my question would be, are there any of those lessons learned from all the different um, debriefs where you're looking at the different experiences? Um, any lessons learned that stand out to you? Maybe, you know, you would even advise us listening, whether we've got a company or whether we've got, you know, a, you know, marketing business or whatnot, just what kind of lessons learned stand out to you? I'm sure you could write a book and you should. Yeah, I've learned a lot, a lot, you know. And, I bet you uh, have. I'm trying to think, I'm trying, some of the um, some of the bigger mistakes I've made yeah. in my career for sure are hiring B engineers to work with A engineers. That's a Yikes. big problem. What happens? <laughs> Fireworks. You can't put bad code in your code base. And, yeah. Um, you know, like for instance, they should have never hired me when I was trying to code. <laughs> faster but the you can't you can't we've got a we've got a really really um talented uh computer science team um that have been working together and uh at past companies um i've felt rushed to build more feature functionality to build more product to scale inge and i've kind of leaned on them to hire more quickly um and that is not the right move you know hiring the right people is more important than hire them hiring them quickly and you know look growing a business in the bay area is really challenging because engineering talent is is really hard you know you have space is that. pricey everything right i mean Tough. you just got to be patient on that front yeah. so I, th I think you can't you know you have to make sure that when you're hiring your eng team and building that out it's got to be like the right one um the right people it's got to be yeah. a good fit from talent perspective, but as you know, additionally from, um, you know, the, just the whole like sort of culture of it. Right. Um, I think, um, other, other mistakes we've made is, um, we've, we've made, we have put revenue goals in front of us in a model. Um, and we've actually ran at that really hard without actually looking at how we're evolving the product. Mm. Um, how, um, how much attention we're paying to, um, finding our product market fit. Cause like, that's what it's all about when you're at a early, great early stage startup is finding your product market fit. Right. And sometimes that road kind of goes like this. And yeah. Yeah. Sometimes not. Um, but I think it's really, um, sometimes you can miss some things, um, when you're running really hard at an ARR target or, um, you know, I think that there's just so many things you can miss. Um, and I think lastly, you know, enjoying the time. Cause I know that, you know, I'm 47 years old. I don't know how many companies I have left in me, but, um, 
a bunch more, man. I'm following you now. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> I, I, I'm just enjoying it. Like even, yeah. even the, the hard parts I'm enjoying because I know that the right. hard parts will get better. And I know that, you know, things change. I've been through it enough times now. So I'm, I'm really kind of enjoying the journey more. Um, yeah. So um, I, I live down in uh, Los Altos Hills where a lot of the people down there have moved out of operating roles or are now on the venture side. And um, it's funny because I, I feel like I'm sort of the old, I feel like I'm sort of like the old guy still in an operating role sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> where they're else they're like, you want to go hit around a round of golf? You're like, guys, uh, we yeah. got our next release coming yeah, out. Exactly. Uh, maybe that's, next week. <laughs> that's more right than you know. Yeah, absolutely. I bet. <laughs> well this is awesome hey where can people find you connect with you linkedin twitter what's what's best for you yeah i mean you know linkedin is um i'm just sean whiteley s-e-a-n-w-h-i-t-e-l-e-y you know sean whiteley on linkedin and you can always go to qualified.com and talk to me on the website i'll be there very cool that's actually a great idea like in this situation just go ahead to the website and and, uh, and chat with you directly there that's that's really cool yeah. it's like practice what you preach right yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we're there all the time. It's uh, learning more every day. So we, we love talking to people right now. We're not at the point where you know, we have you know, hundreds of thousands of people on our site. So um, you know, we haven't actually really started doing a lot of marketing. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our uh, pipeline right now is coming from word of mouth and from yeah. referrals and things like that. And we're okay with that right now it's, uh, as long as that keeps happening. Slow and steady, but it's the, really it's the best kept secret. It's not really kept anymore. So yeah, uh, hopefully not. Yeah, it'll be time to hire those right people you talked about for sure. And, yeah, that's uh, right. and not we are rushing. hiring. We are hiring too. So. Yeah, what are you hiring for? For those listening, We're hiring for SDRs, BDRs, ops roles, end roles. Um, so we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of headcount right now. So um, yeah, if, uh, if anyone out there is listening, um, just go to our careers page on qualified.com/careers, and you can chat with us right there too. Absolutely. And I think some of the, the career advice we've had previously from previous guests have said, I think it was even uh, David Meiselman on episode 100. He was like my very original marketing mentor. He said, you know, if you, if you find a rocket ship, just get on. Don't, don't worry about what seat you're in or, you know, which zone you're in on the airplane. Just get on that rocket ship. And so this, knock, 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 everyone listening. This is, this is one of them. Yeah, well, you put your head down. It's amazing to see. I mean, look, I've I've watched your company grow, and um, you know, it's a lot of hard work has gone into that. But it's great. Like we, I took a year and a half off after I sold my last company, and when I came back to see the growth you guys have experienced is really awesome. And that's what happens when you have good people and you work hard. Yeah, yeah, that that value thing again. Totally, totally. Yeah. I love it. Well, thanks again, man. This has been fantastic. I don't know if you look at the clock. Time just like warped by. <laughs> chatting about stuff you love. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I probably didn't let you get a word in edgewise, but you're oh, asking. No. It's all good, man. A lot, of, a lot of good questions. Yeah, no, I, I could talk about this stuff all day, but I'm sure you got to get back to the projects and the grind and making sure everyone's getting on yeah. qualified. And at one thirty, I'm going to hopefully lock down our new home. So I'm jumping on with a with a with a broker and a and a, and a realtor to see if we can lock in our new space because we're bursting the at the seams in here. You're gonna get like bean bags and all the startup type stuff, or does that? We just we just would like to get a place right now. <laughs> you just need a table. Or later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're in growth mode. This isn't bean bag. This is like we we need the working light and internet. <laughs> exactly, and and also just having someone not breathing down your neck next to you when you're trying to have a call. So that's uh, right, right. Knock, knock, knock. Quiet yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to close a big deal. Uh, well, best of luck to you on that. And I mean, continued growth for Qualify. I'm a big fan. The demo's amazing. You can, I mean, we didn't even sell it. You don't even need to. People just go chat with you and experience. And I think that's the, that's what I recommend. If you haven't been to qualify.com, go there, just start a chat and just see how it's different. And there's some really cool stuff behind the scenes that uh, I, I don't want to give away. But um, yeah, yeah, give it a shot. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, cool, man. Well, thanks again for being on here. And for everyone else out there listening, if you learned something, share this episode with someone else. Be a thought leader to like one or two people. It doesn't even have to be a thousand because I literally have two pages of notes over here of things that I've been learning. So I know you all learn stuff too. And again, share this with someone else. Be a thought leader. And Sean, thanks again, man, for coming on here. Looking forward to you know, meeting up next time we're out there. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Casey. It was awesome to talk to you. Awesome. Take care. And for everyone out there listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We will catch you all next time. Hey, hey, hey.